So welcome everyone to another podcast, my Blue Bricks podcast, in which we talk a lot about real estate, mindset, and all kind of different topics. And today, together with, with Sara uh, as a co-host, our other, our other co-host, Hector couldn't be here because of COVID, I think it was, right Sara? Yeah, he wasn't feeling uh, well uh, because of COVID, exactly. So Hector, uh, feel better, you will be better soon and today we talk with a very interesting guest with Javier and Javier is not a beginning investor he is a more experienced investor and he was talking about a lot of different topics uh well the mindset that you really like Sarah and also seller exactly. financing yeah exactly it's definitely not a, a new episode uh but really really interesting to listen and learn uh more about uh as I said uh, seller financing Exactly. So what he's doing with almost no money out of his own pocket, he bought a bundle deal for around 25 units and he's managing debt. So somebody has been working on that for 30 years. He bought it at once and that is now his financial freedom. This is his monthly income that he's living from and not only him, but also his family, which he will explain at the end of the show. So stay tuned that he will explain that this is, that is his big why. So get ready, get started, sit back, make yourself comfortable, and let's go to today's show. So welcome everyone to the My Blue Bricks podcast, real estate podcast, and we're excited today because together with Sarah, we have a very special, important, and yeah, good contact that we know for for some time already. It's Javier. Welcome, Javier. Thanks for for being here. Thank you, guys, and uh, I'm glad to be here with you. Yeah, let's talk about many things today you have your experience in in real estate you have been in the real estate sector in spain in barcelona i think it is but for sure you have more to explain for a couple of years already could you yeah could you explain about your background until so far sure um i'm an economist by training i started my professional career in in kpmg which is an audit firm um after uh, three years uh, i decided to move to london um uh, in consultancy and I started to work with Alvarez and Marcel, which was a it, it, it was a boutique restructuring firm, very financial, um, but it has grown to a full professional services firm. Um, initially, I was in the um, forensic department uh, because of my previous uh, accounting and audit background, but I went through uh, transactions advisory, which is due diligence and M and A. And after that, I went into restructuring but for the financial services um, sector. So we were by basically um, advising banks or governments uh, in financial distress. And that's why I got uh, you know, in touch with the real estate um, uh, sector, not uh, as a hands-on or uh, on the ground job, looking at properties, but more of a financial um, um, over, overview of it. So it's, it's basically, managing non, non-performing non loans portfolios and selling and buying uh, portfolios of, you know, massive amounts of, uh, of debt and, and real estate. All right. So from a high level perspective more, but did, did so yes. did you learn, you probably learned a lot from debt, which you took to your, yeah, to, to the, all the other things that you're doing, right? Yeah, basically it's, it's crunching numbers and, and managing these projects. It's, for instance, you are the advisor to the bank or to the, or to the fund. And of course, you have to do the numbers to, to, to see if, if this transaction makes sense or not. But you have to delegate and rely on lots of different professionals. Since, for instance, you know the the, the surveyors, which are going to um, survey the the real estate and say how much it's worth. Uh, then the lawyers, um, which are actually reviewing if some legislation is more prone to have conflicts in terms of repossessing the properties or not. So it's you learn a bit of everything, mm. but technically speaking, you're only looking at the numbers. Uh, yeah. But it, it, it has a, it gives you a lot of uh, uh, overview on how the real estate works. Mm. Yeah. So for also, it's a very high high level and, and very professional. So for instance, I don't know what in in, in the UK. I, I presume that the real estate uh, sector is quite professionalized mm. uh, as compared to the to Spanish uh, real estate because in Spain, especially if you're Spanish, I think that most people think that real estate it's not something very technical. It's something that everyone can do. Mm. Um, when you work at this level, you realize that it's far from far from real. Yeah. So you have very very technical people, uh, very professional. But of course, these are massive transactions. So 
yeah. it's difficult to translate it into the micro world uh, that I'm working at the moment, but it, it gives you like a way of thinking and structured deals and, and it, it's very good. And you were living that time in England then, right? That's why you're referring to the UK. Yes, exactly. I was living in the UK, but to be honest, I spent there most of the weekends because I was uh, traveling on a weekly basis. And in fact, I spent two years in, in Amsterdam uh, in a hotel. So it's not that I could see too much of it, but I was traveling a lot. Yeah. And so high over macro, like you're saying, macro analysis, calculations, what, how did it then happen that in the end you're ending up in the city, Barcelona, where you're from, I think, right? Originally in, yeah, yeah. in real estate on a micro level, how, how did it go? Well, um, my father has started this, uh, this business like before I was born and it was a very small firm, uh, property management firm. And I was involved with it of course since i was a kid uh, helping them on on you know during summer or something like that so i, I have always been in touch with real estate and, and looking at properties but um the reason why i came back was basically you know after years of catching up four planes a week and working 100 plus hours a week, yeah yeah i mean the money was okay but if you i mean think about having a family or having a work-life uh, balance it wasn't it wasn't actually uh, what I was looking for so I just decided to come back to, to Barcelona I didn't know ex I didn't know exactly what to do so I just started in, in my father's company it took me a while actually to adjust to the well reality which is another country smaller deals uh, much less professional uh, environment uh, it took me a while but since I got used to it uh, so n now I'm okay I was about to quit honestly and look for a for a position in a fund um, but you know we found this deal and we bought it and actually I think it's uh, the reason why I'm still uh, running the management well the company yeah yeah it's funny how sometimes it goes right Sarah for you as well you never actually thought about ending up in real estate but in the end you did right it's yeah. also for you similar yeah, yeah, exactly. I think you never know when you start in the career you start, where are you going to end? Exactly. Yeah. The end. Yeah. So I'm almost now for seven years in, in Spain and I also came to work in Spain, not to work in real estate, except yeah. to work for a big company. And I didn't know anything about real estate. I didn't want to know everything, anything about real estate. And then in the end, you're ending up in something like that. It's funny how, how life goes, right? And then, yeah. Um, yeah. So your the the linking factor was then the your father that had experience in real estate that brought you mm -hmm. into the company that he already created was it like that Yeah 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 exactly yeah so I, I just so before moving to Spain um, of course I looked for positions but you know money wise it was nothing compared to to London I thought I'm gonna do same sort of job. Uh, earning le well, less than half uh, what I'm making in, in the UK. Mm. It doesn't make sense. So I just decided to go back to the family business and, and at least it was something that was, you know, uh, our business. Yours. Um, yeah, I'm, not, yeah. I'm not that concerned. In fact, I'm, I'm, I'm not that concerned about making money, but more about, you know, enjoying what you're doing and, and trying to grow um, the, you know, our personal portfolio. Yeah. yeah and then it's also a big difference from working in a big company to working in your own company where you need to do all the small things where you know yeah. you don't have to think about in a big mm -hmm. company right exactly so, yeah uh, you need to think about uh, your employees you need to think about payments you need to think uh, every yeah. but it's also very rewarding when at one point it, it works and then uh well it, it, it's for, it looks like you you made your way you also worked on everything yourself and then now it's working more because now at this moment you are managing a a property management company here mm -hmm. in barcelona right yes it's a small uh, property uh management company so it's, it's nothing big um in fact it it could be well when i moved back to spain part of the let's say deal was that I had to expand the business, grow. Um, but to be honest, it wasn't something that it was really appealing to me. Uh, that's why I almost quit and, and, and you know, signed for a, for a position. But again, I was more involved in the investment side of the business and that's mm. what really kept me and, and I really like that. So now I'm in a position that I spent more I spend more time um, investing rather than managing the business 
and it's good for sure because I'm, you know, I'm growing a personal portfolio, but it's not that good for a business either because it's, it's like, you know, Taking your time away from, yeah. Exactly. So we're not growing. Uh, of course, we're having new clients and all the stuff, but for instance, I'm, I don't have time to um, professionalize some areas that I would like to improve or improve processes. So it's something that it's, it's like in, in standstill at the moment. Mm. Uh, but you know, perhaps at some some point I will have more free time and and concentrate on this stuff. Yeah. So you you created a machine more or less, or you optimized the machine, and now that that is working and it's and it's moving, and you're getting some new clients. However, you're also spending more time. And then, so how, how did you how did you do that? So you created this kind of a passive income stream that is working. That some presence of you is then is needed, but not that much because you can also focus on the investing part. Right? Is that? Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, in fact, um, I, I was actually what I did was to give more responsibility to the people we had in the in the business. So previously, my my father was actually doing most not not doing most of it, but uh, making all the decisions, even for small things. Uh, for me, that wasn't actually worth it. So I tried to give more responsibility to the people that we already had and mm. say, look, um, if this this amount or if this type of uh, problem just solve it yourself and uh, that freed me up uh, some time for myself and, and to be able to invest um, I know I would like to have a bigger um, uh, you know team but at the same time I'm focused on growing the portfolio so I need to balance uh, these two areas and I, I, to be honest at the moment I'm really busy with my family as well with the kids which are really small yeah um, so I'm thinking things easier and for the time being I'm just focusing on on, on the investment uh, side if they grow up a bit a little bit and they are less demanding on, on on time then I will be able to concentrate a bit more on the on the business yeah yeah, it's also yeah. for you, right, Zara, with your team that you're managing. And then at one point, it's just creating things that you were still, you were in the business always. And now you created a team that is then doing the business for you. Uh, it sounds yeah. like something similar than for Javier. Yeah, exactly. That you still have the responsibility to manage them and everything, but you you have a bit more freedom. Exactly. Do you think that... that change uh, you did in the company was uh, also because you came from um, a professional uh, environment on how um, to I don't think I understood the question because of the internet. Ah, sorry. Um, I meant that um, you professionalizing more the company uh, and maybe stepping out a bit of everyday decisions was influenced yeah. by your uh, your past role. Yeah, absolutely. Why do you so the reality is that since I came from a restructuring uh, background and consulting, so we, we were with clients, we were very focused on, um, you know, streamlining processes, optimizing uh, teams. Um, so typically you come to a client and, and start to, you know, uh, restructure everything like the teams. And when I came to Spain, I, I just uh, First, I trying to learn um, what the business was about, and then of, with my mindset, I was just, you know, figure, figuring out how to uh, optimize every single process. But the reality was that it's very good when you're a consultant uh, for a big firm and you go, for instance, to a bank or to a big corporate and say, "Okay, you guys have to do this uh, from A to Z." Then you have a bunch yeah. of people uh, and re resources just to do that stuff. Mm. But it's very difficult when you have to do it with, uh, you know. 40 year old company with people who are older than you and you are the guy doing most of uh, most of it so it, it was a it was it was a dose for, of reality for myself and uh, i had to change this mindset of being focused on on small things and the streamlining process i was about to, to end up crazy and then i changed my mindset and i thought okay just forget about that you have to focus on results other than uh, processes so if something is not streamlined if it's not optimal i don't give a fuck anymore it's just okay it needs to be done please so yeah. that's it and the moment i i just did a click uh uh well 
I started to, to live much more freely and relaxed because it was a constant stress because I was not growing uh, revenue. I wasn't actually perfecting, perfecting the process at all. And people were actually very pissed off with me. Like, okay, why do we need to change this process right now? I mean, yeah. it's not, it's not making any difference to the, to the revenue, but that's, that's something that I had to learn on, on the hard way. Yeah. There's also some things with property management companies, right? That there's some, because how you earn money, if I understand correctly, is that it's quantity, right? Because you always have yeah. a commission on every property that you manage. You were just explaining that, or it's the fee that you earn when people sign a new contract. So it's quantity where you need, where you need, where you need to earn your money. So there's also quantity, but also a lot of customers and moments that you can do something wrong. Uh, right so more quantity yeah. more things that you could maybe not do wrong and then the things that you're doing right the whole time is when you don't hear that much so normally we are saying also in our property management business which is a little exactly. bit different it's room rentals when you don't do anything yeah. it's good but when you know something doesn't go wrong we now have about more than 260 rooms then immediately there's a lot of emotion involved also with some uh, stereotypes about property management about things that yeah they keep money or they don't work that hard exactly. for what they want to say so we we are fighting always with that and trying to create success moments as good as possible we're a little bit more yeah. involved with the people because the room rentals there are five people yeah. living in the same apartment so we need to create a good environment so mm -hmm. there are no frustrations are coming up uh, but then when it doesn't go well they will let you know that you're not doing Absolutely. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you only you only listen to bad feedback. If there is not feedback, exactly. that, that's good news. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so then we should maybe turn it or try to turn it around to because there are even bigger companies, way bigger companies, and they it's it's professionally thinking about how to get these good reactions then out of the people as well and it is possible it is possible but like you're saying at one point you need to think how much are you doing yourself and how much do you want to automate and how much do you want to give away to other people yeah. and also the question how much do you want to grow right because with growing also comes with other things like processes and your own company so so we are a little bit in that as well um growing we are we are growing before covid we had I think it was 62 rooms, 62. Wow. And after COVID, tough times, a lot of people, room renters, they went home to their country, yeah. but also a lot of opportunities in terms of apartments, right? So yes, it was also yeah. a little bit contra contradictive because at one point the economy is kind of bad, lays on the ground. At the same time, there's a lot of opportunities and now it's yeah. turning around again. Now the economy is good, but the homeowners are not that willing that much to rent yeah. and why? Because they think they can rent it out easy or rent it out for kind of same prices, um, but yeah, we, we are in that phase that we do, that we try to grow, uh, but growing is another dimension. If you need to, we need to organize that then for sure. Yeah. yeah. So so you were saying that that okay, property management business in the beginning you had some troubles. Maybe you wanted to mm -hmm. not even continue, but you continue because there was also yeah. an investment investment part of that, yeah. right? And and that. And that is something that you really then like, if I understand it correctly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So we, we had actually a, a, a customer who passed away, sadly, and um, there was a person inheriting like the portfolio that we were managing, and this person just wanted to sell. Um, the view of my father was, look, we have a whole year or two of selling all these properties with a good commission, so it's, it's good work. It will keep us busy. Um, but coming from a you know, the the background that I had buying and selling portfolios of properties, I just thought, okay, this is something that we could buy. I, I don't know where I will get the money from, but if it is working for this person actually, and it's been providing a good revenue for life, it would be a good opportunity to do actually the work of, you know, a person who spent 30 years investing in just one transaction, right? Yeah, yeah. And I just crunched the numbers and I thought, okay, I think this is doable. My father was, okay, you're crazy. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm already nearly to my 60s. I don't have any debt, so, so I don't want to get involved into that. Uh, but I tried to convince him and I persuaded him finally. finally. And yeah, we, we, we bought this uh, this bundle. It wasn't simple, but we managed to do it. And in fact, it's been all, almost two years that I was purely focused on, on this transaction. And of course, my business side uh, was also affected because I wasn't that much involved. And, uh, but I think it was worth it. 
Cool, and that is then the, the bundle deal or the, the yeah. bigger transaction. My first bundle. deal actually. Ah, yeah. Ah, okay. It was my first deal, so I didn't own any properties uh, whatsoever. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, I just saw that. I thought, come on. I mean, I, I, can't, I can't miss these opportunities. But then you're in a privileged situation that you're seeing that these things <clears throat> from close and that you took use of the opportunity that was in front of you. But you needed to then also convince other people that were not that much on your on your side. Right? Well, and that's happening yeah. so many times. How did you do that? Well, first we had to, for, I mean, first the owner, right? So if if you think of them, they if they value each property, um, it's, it's just simple math thinking of, okay, if I sell unit by unit, I'll make more than just saying on a bundle. That's fine. Uh, that's fine and possible if all the units are empty and if they are in perfect conditions, right? Mm. Uh, so first we tried actually, uh, I, I wanted to buy, but first I tried to, um, you know, sell uh, the bundle uh, to some investors just so that the, the, the owners realized that I wasn't actually trying to take advantage of them because I, I made an offer and they said, oh no, this is unacceptable because this might be that much worth. I said, okay, that's, that's, that's fine, but n it's something that not many people could buy in one go. And it's something that investors have to buy because you're not going to be able to sell one by one because you have, I know, rentas antiguas, you've got contracts of, for leases for 30 years. So it wasn't very simple to do that. Mm. And after a while trying to sell these properties, they realized that the offers that they were getting were even lower than, than mine. Uh, so, well, they were open then to, to start negotiating. So that's, that's why I made very well my numbers. And, and of course, I was offering more than other investors would be willing to pay. But I was offering more because we had the, um, the view of the whole properties. We were running the portfolio. So yeah, we knew, knew that, actually. Yeah. Knew exactly. So that, that's some power of advantage that I have. Yeah. Yeah. And then tell, tell us a little bit more because you were, you, you, in the end, they agreed upon seller financing, right? Yes. So could, could you maybe, before we go there, mm. could you explain uh, quickly what then seller financing is for the people that are listening yes. to this? And seller financing, it's, it's not that common in Spain. And it's basically instead of financing the, uh, the deal going through a bank or, a, you know, any any other type of lending it's speaking with the landlord or, or the owner and saying look why don't you finance yourself this uh this deal and it's financing it's just simply giving you uh the opportunity to pay in different in different um uh, dates so not just in one go and it's not common of course because the value of money today it it's more than the value of money in five years time or in three years time mm -hmm. and most people just want to have money right now uh, mm. because they don't know what's going to happen in three years time right um so they have to have some motivation to accept to this seller financing in that case was actually that one nobody was paying as much as they wanted to receive um i was offering more uh conditions so that they allowed me to pay in in two in two tranches right um and I have also sold some um, properties through seller financing, financing it myself. And it was was it because I was desperate to sell? Not exactly, but they were properties that they were difficult to sell. I could have kept them, but I had two properties with a 40 year contract, which I thought, okay, um, for the amount I'm paying, uh, it's not worth it for me to keep these properties for 40 years. Hmm. If I want to sell these properties today, today on in the market, uh, nobody is going to pay uh, market value because they see these long leases. So they, yeah. they're going yeah. to ask me for a, for a huge discount. So what I did was actually sticking to the to their tenants and saying, look, buy me this property at market value. Okay, so I'm, I'm getting full price. Uh, but instead of going to a bank yourself, which is going to be more costly, um, potentially, I knew that they would not be able to get financing from a bank. I just offered to finance them. Um, and I, it was a win-win situation because they could buy the property. And on, on, on the other hand, I was getting full price plus a percentage of the, of the financing. And they're paying you the monthly, right? Yes, exactly. Yes. So they pay me monthly. 
it's not like an um, alkylator con opción de cobra. It's basically just a a, a, a normal cell. So yeah. from day one, they own. Javier, let me first say. So uh, alquiler con opción de compra means yeah. Um, ah, yeah, renting with the option to to buy at one point. Exactly. Like, like a it, option. Correct. It's not that. It's just pure sale. Uh, yeah. But it's the same as you buy a property from a from a you know, from someone else and you have a, a mortgage with a bank. So yeah. in that case, I was providing a mortgage to the uh, to the owners. And the moment that they stop paying, uh, I could repossess the property. Uh, it would be mine again, and they would have lost uh, every amount that they have already paid. I am then curious because they were rent antiguas, right? So their their tenants with a very long contract. No, no, there was. Okay. In, in these two cases, they were in rent antiguas. They just had a very long lease, which I don't know why the landlord, uh, well, the previous owner, just agreed on 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 this sort of long leases. Yeah. Uh, they they made no sense, uh, but well, they worked for him, mm -hmm. uh, and and there were people that in in the end, I mean, they could have stayed for these forty years. Uh, and that's it. So you, they had no reason to to buy, but it was a it was a moment that I thought, okay, man, wh why not? Why not buying? I mean, you're gonna spend the best of your life just paying for this rent, and in the end, it's gonna be mine anyway. So yeah. I'm just offering you the, the chance to to own this property right now, and they agreed. Okay, so mm. and they and are they now paying more on a monthly basis or in the same amount of what they have been paying? So my question is, if they're paying now more, then probably you you convince them by paying a little bit more, but then the property is going to be yours. Or are they paying the same? Or what is the setup there? No, no, they they are paying more because um, they are paying more, but in the end, it's it's their property. It's their property. So it's, okay. It's, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I get it. Yeah. Okay, and, and and how are you managing that portfolio? Because well, uh, Sara and me are buying. Then now we're now busy a lot in Valencia, next to mm -hmm. Barcelona, where the mm -hmm. where if the room rental in Valencia, we're buying a lot of flip projects. We're buying rent yeah. in Barcelona. We're keeping some for ourselves, and we're buying now a couple, or we're trying. We're now going to buy a uh, first few there in Valencia, right, Sara? Yeah. Normally, you buy one apartment. You immediately bought a bundle. How is that now? How are you managing that? Because you were explaining that sometimes some of them you're keeping, you're renting it out, some of them yeah. you're renovating, some are you you are selling to get some money in to then do some other renovations or some other yeah. investing. How, how is that? How is it going? Well, um, initially, you have to think that all the properties were rented. So one of the the objectives for myself was just if I sign this and I get seller financing. In day one, I will get the income, right? Without paying full price. Hmm. Um, that's what that was, of course, important for a cash flow perspective. But also, um, it was good for the bank because we tried to finance the um, the whole purchase with the bank, and they said, "There's no way we're gonna give you this amount of money." And that's an important property. point, right? Because the bank is yeah. looking different at you exactly. and at, at your risk profile instead of seller yeah. financing, which we haven't been discussing so far, maybe. But exactly. financing is super because the the seller is going to be the bank, and they are looking at different. Uh, measurements to 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 make up the risk profile, right? Yeah, so, and that happened. I, yeah, it, it was a shame actually because every time I went to a you know a, a bank office and I spoke about the transaction and and I presented the numbers and how I wanted to finance the transaction, they said huh, they got well, every every office director said, "Look, this is wonderful. Uh, I'd love to invest in that." But the bank is not going to allow me to give you this amount of money because it doesn't actually fit in the risk profile. But I, I completely agree with you. And I was telling them, look, you would be able to give me the same amount of money if I want to buy my flat or a house, but you are not going to lend me this money when I'm buying a portfolio, which is already cash flowing. So it's, yeah, it's yeah. insane. Yeah. yeah, we know, we know, but this is the, you know, it's not bank policy, so we, we can't yeah. offer you that. Okay, fine. So what do, what do we have to do? And then they said, okay, pay at least 50% of it and we'll give you the other 50%. So that's why I negotiated with the, with the seller. Okay, I, let, me, let me sign um, for the purchase without paying you 50%, just paying the, the, the taxes like ATP. Uh, but I was already uh, the owner of the properties just by paying the ATP. So when I went to the, uh, to the bank, the they ETP okay. is the uh, profit, the, the yeah. purchasing taxes upon purchasing exactly. something in Spain. Yeah. 
So they saw, they thought, okay, now you are the owner of the properties, even if you have not paid for them in full yet, and you are the owner of this cash flow. So we can think of, we can look at things differently, mm. and now we can give you 50%. So with this 50%, I just paid uh, the, the owner. And meanwhile, I was able actually to sell uh, some properties to get the other 50%. So to the bank, I went already with the full ownership, full cash flow, plus 50% of the deal on the table. Mm. Okay. So that is not only seller financing, that's creative financing because you yeah. made the deal, a big deal work yeah. with whatever you needed to do to, to get it done. And But yeah. that is then, I mean, you start your career, I wouldn't say your career, but you made a big step. And from there, you can leverage in a lot of ways, right? You can sell some property, like you were saying, you can go to the bank, they take yeah. it more seriously. At one point, maybe the value is increasing. So you, you can have a look at, I don't know, getting some overvalue out with, with a bank finance. That's super, super yeah. interesting. Yeah. Hmm. In fact, there's few properties that I own that they are actually affected by a uh, mortgage. So most of them are free of debt and I could get more more debt to buy more but uh we have well i i look at the picture like from from a higher level and i see that i also own a business which has some debt so it's in the end i cannot borrow um, as much as i would like to well i could but it would be too risky for me and i'm happy with that level of risk so i'm, I'm okay with that maybe I'm, I'm gonna be slower uh in terms of buying for the next years but that would be safer because you know you have a family, you have a business, so you cannot actually uh, bet everything on the same on the same card. But technically speaking, uh, I don't have uh, uh, a very indebted portfolio, which is which is good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and from there, that is leverage, right? That is yeah, leverage exactly. that you that you can create, yeah. and that is what investors mm -hmm. or I think anyone who is owning real estate is, is looking for. So yeah, yeah that's. Um, maybe again for the people that are listening to this and they're not 100% into real estate so seller financing is then not directly going to the bank but the seller is becoming the bank right so they are giving you kind of a loan and they're looking at different things to come up with a risk profile so if you want to do that that's then creative financing which is super uh, that can give you a lot of lot of benefits so um, that, yeah that's interesting so Sadi, is there anything more regarding the seller financing his bundle profile before we move on maybe to some other questions yeah i wanted to ask like um what's uh, that your uh, portfolio what's composed of they are all residentials in barcelona no so initially i i to be honest right now i don't i don't have a clear picture but, but initially when i when i bought the the the, um, the portfolio i think it was maybe 70% residential and 30% uh, commercial. Uh, now it has changed a little bit because we sold some properties. And it was basically um, city well, Barcelona in city center, plus some other towns nearby Barcelona, like Badalona, Santa Coloma, Hospitalet, um, okay. Gaba, all these, these areas. But very, I mean, it's something that we can manage in, in Barcelona and, and it's very simple. So it's not that they are very scattered across uh, Catalonia. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. And also, I mean, this person or this group, I don't know, family of this person was working on it for, I don't know how many years, their whole career, 30 apartments. And then, but at one point, things happen in life, right? Sometimes you want to get rid of it, you want yeah. to sell it, you want to have a big pension or you don't want to, or your family doesn't want to have it anymore. So imagine now for the people that are listening to this and they're thinking, hey, how can I start? Or, or at one point, how can I get to a bigger portfolio? These things actually happen. And you can, so one person is working their whole life for that. They can try to sell it to someone and you can optimize that. So you're now doing it, Javier. And also we haven't been talking about it that much. You're doing a creative financing setup with not that much of your own capital needed in the whole deal, if I uh, understand it correctly, right? Yeah, well, the thing is that initially, yeah, that, that, that's totally right. But think you have to consider that the bank was asking me for having 50% of the deal on the table. So that, that was money that I didn't have. Uh, but of course, since, since the seller agreed for me just to pay for initial taxes and pay after a year and a half in two tranches, that gave me opportunity to sell properties that I techn technically owe but I didn't, I haven't had paid them for. 
Mm -hmm. uh, that's the way I created cash that I didn't have. I don't think, to be honest, it was a very particular situation. And I don't think it's impossible to replicate that. Of course, of course, it's not impossible, but it has to be very, very specific, uh, you know, situation with very specific terms. And that's why I thought, okay, that's a once in a lifetime opportunity. Yeah. So, yeah. Yes, it's possible. So if you read books, if you read um, blogs, everyone would say, yeah, it's very doable, you know, no money down, you can build your real estate portfolio. Yeah, that's fine. I have done that. But to be honest and to have that, you know, people do should not expect to, to be able yeah. to do that easily. Yeah. And maybe also like, not your first deal, right? If you start yeah. first start out for the people that listen to this, maybe this yeah. is not your first purchase. However, it was yeah. your then serious first yeah. purchase. So mm -hmm. that is also still doable. But let me so, so break down a little bit. So then 50% seller finance, that money was not really you, but you created a agreement with then the seller. And then yeah. with them becoming kind of the owner, you could go to the bank for the other 50%. Exactly. Now that 50% from a seller finance, you could pay some other uh, purchase taxes and other payments in one and a half years, you were saying. So that one and a half year was a window for you to start to sell part of the portfolio. And with selling these apartments, you were getting some money to be making in the payments to then the seller, which is amazing. So what you are doing actually here is you don't have any capital, for sure you have some capital invested there, but minim minimum capital and you make you make possible a deal like this, which normally, like you're saying, it's, it will be impossible. So that's hmm. a, a huge, huge, huge motivation uh, for, yeah. for all of us. Um, yeah. Yeah, super At cool. some point, I was obsessed about it, honestly. So uh, I was sleeping and I had all the, the mm -hmm. spreadsheets on my on my head. And I was I was really obsessed about uh, making it the real possible that I think my wife was like, okay, I mean, don't tell me anything about real estate or this mm -hmm. project. But I think it's worth it in the end. But uh, sometimes you have to be obsessed about something uh, in order to really make it possible. You need to want it, yeah. but very, yeah. very bad want it. <laughs> and if you want it as bad as, for example, Sarah and, and you and me, of course, then you make things like this possible. So mm. um, let's go to the next section and let's yeah. go to one important question, perhaps. Uh, what is something what you would advise for the people that are listening? Is there a book that gives you inspiration or podcast or what other people can, can do something what you have been doing? Well, to be honest, I think I mean, you guys are also uh, uh, an inspiration and, and you are creating a community which is which is really cool and, and people are sharing the, the knowledge freely, which is which is amazing. And initially I just started with bigger pockets. Uh, there was no content in Spanish. Now we have more offers and, and that's fine. I still I still uh, listen to uh, bigger pockets, not as regularly as I used to, but I think it's, it's good from time to time from a uh, um, inspirational uh, point of view because of course we are very focused on the American market and not everything is translatable to to, to Spain yeah. but at least it, it you know opens opens your mind and and that's what that's that's one thing no right listening to podcast or um, reading emails sorry emails uh, um, books but also very important to share your knowledge with other investors because now I'm in in different communities and I see there's a lot of new newbies that's that's for sure Hmm. But it's not such a, a big, actually, um, environment, the real estate sector in Spain. And, and whenever you get involved with that, you, you start finding the same people uh, and, and you know more or less a group of people that you could actually ask questions freely. Some of them are more friendlier than, than others, but it's good that you can share this, this knowledge and, and it helped me a lot, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so, for example, Sara, is there anything that you would advise for other people? Are you getting a lot of motivation? Is that a book, podcast? Uh, yeah, I think so. Bigger Pockets, it's a, it's a big, uh, um, a big thing that I'm following. Um, and then books, a uh, little bit more uh, mindset-wise. Yeah. Uh, like uh, you were saying at the beginning, like Atomic Habits, mm. for example, was a big one for me as well. Um, yeah, just books in general on the mindset. Yeah. True. Uh, yeah. There's, there's also one thing actually that uh, many people, when I speak to them, it's like, okay, I want to invest, I want to make money, I want to grow a portfolio. That's fine. Uh, but 
not many people actually have a reason why it's like okay, why why are you willing to to do that or why are you willing to sacrifice you know your your yeah the why yeah. your effort so so and and i really had a, a a really clear why which was okay i want to have more free time i want to spend time with my family i, I want to grow my family and that was very okay yeah i have to really make an effort today so that i can enjoy my time with them at some point and for me that was the reason why but i think you really need to have a reason why otherwise it's it's pointless just uh, you know wasting your time you could be better off on you know hiking in the nature yeah mm. it's true because even if you yeah. have success with real estate or your own company you do get sometimes in a tunnel vision and you need to get yeah. yourself out of it so working for a big company working for yourself you always need to think about that so it's very much true so uh, Javier, it was amazing. You are doing an amazing job. We, yeah, we we yeah. love to hear stories like this. Um, thanks for making the time available and this for the moment. Um, Sarah, are you yeah. or uh, are shall I take take yourself out uh, of yeah. the, this podcast? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, and well, we we talk soon. Yeah, thank you guys. It was okay. a pleasure. And so this keep was in touch. exactly so this was the podcast. We're going out now. So Sarah, it was a very nice podcast talking with Javier, right? Yeah, exactly. Really interesting. And also um I think it's really important to what she what he said about having a why while you're pursuing this goal. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. of the why you're just running, you're just running without really why, and and it it sounds simple, but it's not that simple, okay? Because yeah. you start, you tend to forget that a lot of times, uh, but that's very much true. And also, what he built up, the seller financing deal, is quite amazing to hear that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, very, very uh, creative and, and good to learn more about that. So what he did was literally but almost no money out of his own pocket, buying yeah. a bundle deal of 25 units. I think it was 25 units where somebody yeah. has been working on for 30 years. So again, then if he's doing that kind of stuff, that is available and that's possible in the real estate sector if you have the right context. So that is super motivating. Um, yeah. So if you want to know more about us, follow us on the social media platforms, my Blue Bricks podcast, you'll hear a lot about us more and for now Sarah can you take us out uh, yeah so uh, we'll see you uh, on the following episode thanks for listening exactly and we are now signing out see you soon ciao